solution. I'm so thankful I've decided to change my ways. Welcome back to the Leaving Eden podcast. My name is Gabrielle Hakoen. And I'm cult survivor and cult expert, Sadie Carpenter. How are you doing today, Sadie? How's your life? Life is okay. This episode is extremely exciting (laughs) and terrible and exciting. (laughs) This episode is going to be really exciting. Um, Today's episode is about a man named Peter Ruckman, a a very controversial figure within fundamentalism. Sadie, do you want to tell us uh, a little bit about this guy? Actually, I'd like to let him introduce himself in his own words. I do need to start with a pre-TWTW here because oh God. <laughs> this very short eight-second clip that I want to play for you condones racism and explicitly supports the KKK. So here's that clip. I'll tell you why I never joined the Ku Klux Klan is because we're anti-Semitic. And that's the only reason I didn't join. <laughs> I mean, I agree with everything else they say. So, in- <laughs> I, oh. I would like to further caution you that the racism is not really going to let up. Okay. Throughout the episode, uh, <laughs> TW before the <laughs> before everything, and I'll and I'll give our listeners a heads up on how we're going to treat that when we get to, when we get to the official trigger warning. That clip is from 1993. Uh, Peter Ruckman is giving one of his famous chalk talk sermons in which he talked about prophecy and end times and scripture interpretation. Those were his big topics of choice. And right before he gets to that point in the clip, he's he's actually talking about the protocols. He's talking about different anti-Semitic conspiracy theories, and he's mostly getting it right on why these theories are wrong and harmful. Immediately after he says something that is correct, he goes on to be incredibly, unashamedly racist. I just want to say that in his quote, um, I do applaud Peter Ruckman for being a true ally of the Jewish people. (laughs) (laughs) No, I'm joking. He's not. We do not claim him. Um, But yeah, I think that the theme of saying something that, that is like that sounds really right and then immediately following up with the most insane thing that you've ever heard is going to be a recurring theme throughout this episode. Yes, and also sometimes he skips the part where he says something right first. <laughs> um, Peter Ruckman was, if I could describe him, describe him in a sentence, he was Steven Anderson before Steven Anderson was Steven Anderson. Both of these men had controversial views on the King James Version that were kind of a line in the sand moment for the IFB movement as a whole. They both had polarizing views on other topics like standards. They both have devoted followers and outspoken critics. And both Ruckman and Anderson would hate that I'm comparing them because they had major beef when Ruckman was alive. (laughs) I absolutely love Fundy Beef. I find it amazing. And I oh, you're going to love this episode then. This episode is like 60% Fundy Beef. <laughs> I am here for it. But before we get into that, the Leaving Eden podcast is the podcast about my BFF and co-host, cult expert, cult survivor, Sadie Carpenter's life in and escape from the independent fundamental Baptist church, the church in which she was raised, the cult in which she was raised. Um, We talk about this cult. We talk about other cults. We talk about religion. We talk about fundamentalism, uh, a myriad of topics. We talk about the real and present threat that cults and cult ideologies pose to society as a whole. And it is our goal to promote freedom of mind, freedom of thought and freedom of religion. So if you like our show, if you are a fan of our show, then there's a couple of things that you can do to support us. Easiest thing you can do is hit that follow or that subscribe button or the um, whatever button it is that gets you that new episode every Monday morning. Um, That really does help us out. If you want to join our Patreon and get all of our episodes a day early, um, a a special extended uncensored ad free version of all of our episodes a day early, um, then you can join our Patreon, which is patreon.com slash leaving Eden podcast. And we do have fun over on the Patreon. There's a lot of cool cool bonus content up there. 
you can join our Facebook group uh, and our subreddit. Both of these are called Eden Exodus. So it's facebook.com slash groups slash Eden Exodus and reddit.com slash r slash Eden Exodus. The Facebook group is really like the main discussion forum for this podcast. There's almost 3,000 people in there. Um, and it's a great place to share your personal stories, to you know, ask questions, to just post interesting observations, maybe even share a funny religion-related meme that's – that's uh, sometimes it's light, sometimes it's heavy, but it's a good time. And uh, I, I, is, is that it before we thank the patrons? Oh, pride stories. That's what I got to – Oh, yeah. To, to, yeah, Sadie, do you want to do the spiel on the pride stories? Sure. If you have a story about – Anything related to fundamentalism and your own story as a member of the LGBTQ plus community, this could be a funny story, a triumphant story, a difficult story, anything that you'd like to share with us and have read on the podcast, you can send that over to leavingedenpod at gmail.com. Yeah, and we will be choosing some of those stories to read on air during Pride Month. This podcast is not only affirming, but also half of us are queer people, the, the me half. Um, but <laughs> but I want to amplify queer voices other than my own as we do our whole month of Pride-related content. We've got a lot of exciting things coming in June. We've got some of the documentary-style episodes. We've got some interviews. There's one interview in particular. We'll probably tell you who it is in the next few weeks sometime. But uh Oh, it's exciting. <laughs> I'm really I'm really stoked on it. We got um this we we got an interview with landed with somebody who, you know, for years I was Sadie and I were be were like, you know who would be a really great interview on this show is this person. And we reached out to this person in the past couple of weeks and they agreed to come on this show for a special episode during Pride Month and 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 talk to us about it. I, I, I'm I'm unbelievably stoked for it it's yeah. a very cool person um so that's got, all we can say <laughs> so we've got a lot of different kinds of special content coming up uh, but if you have a story that you'd like to share with us and give us permission to read on air you can send that to leaving eden pod at gmail.com make sure you include what name you'd like us to use for you as well as your pronouns and uh we'll choose some of those to read on air during pride month yeah, I, I love the Pride Month tradition that we have going. And um, we're also going to have some special merch designs coming out. And all of the Pride merch, uh, all of the, the proceeds from our Pride merch are, are going to go to a LGBTQ focused charity. We haven't decided which one yet for this year, but it will be something very cool uh, that that we support because that community really is in need of a lot of support these days. So we're going to do what we do best and run our mouths, but we'll also put our money where our mouth is. Yeah. Um, I think I'm going to thank our Faith Promise Missions and I gave it all to your patrons now. I gave it all to your patrons. Same to, as always, Kathleen Moncrief and Melissa Mosley, two true amazing humans. We do love ye. Thank you so much to Kathleen and Melissa. And then we have our Faith Promise Missions tier patrons. Your names are Alex P., Alex Todd. Alicia Guild, Ali Allen, Anisha Patel, Brooke Tolly, Carissa, Crystal Patterson, Dear Ethan Hansen, The Musical, Eleanor Donahue, Emery Fairlosser, Enchanted Fairy 1389, Esther Muroff, is it Muroff or Muroff? Esther Muroff, please tell me your name. Uh, 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 Esther, send me a message with your uh, the, connect, the correct pronunciation of your name so I make sure I get it right. Anyway, Esther M, that's what I'm going to call you. Hannah Ross, Hope Norum, Horton Hears a Shane, Janine Callan, Jen Kaharski, Jessica Tambo, Jonna, Kat Henwood, Kay Terwee, Kristen Marie, Linda Morgan, Lindsay Goss, Lorena Watson, Madeline Cusick, Marlena Stuve, Mary Williams, Mary Martin, Megan Arendt, Rob the Methodist, Sarah Reese, Scooby Sleuth, Sir Tixalot, hashtag It's Cool I Have Tourette's LMAO, um, Stephanie Johnson, Susie, Tara McNamara, Tiffany Enderby, and Wes the Cowboy. Thank you so much.
to all of our Faith Promise Missions tier patrons, our I Gave It All tier patrons, and everybody over on Patreon who is supporting us. You guys truly are the reason why we can actually devote the time that we need to devote to getting this show made. So speaking of an episode that took a lot of time to research, are you ready to get into the trigger warning and start this episode? Oh yeah, I do have a feeling that this TW is going to be uh, heavy on the racism here. Let's go, hit me. <laughs> So in general, we talk about a lot of potentially triggering topics on this show, including but not limited to suicide and mental health, racism, misogyny, PTSD, PTSD symptoms, child abuse, mental, physical, and sexual abuse, and spiritual abuse, including guilt, shame, and fear. In most episodes, we'll mention at least a few of these topics, but we try to avoid graphic detail unless it's relevant to the story that we're telling, and we do our best to give our audience a heads up before going into detail on any of these topics or anything else that we know can be triggering to people. This episode in particular will contain so much discussion of racism. So much. <laughs> this guy's super racist. <laughs> Literally every paragraph this guy writes is racist. I don't want to overburden our listeners who are people of color. So what I've chosen to do is to not include any direct quotes quotes that have racial slurs in them. The worst of his quotes I've paraphrased rather than quoting in order to try to take some of the sting out of those words. It's honestly so bad that, that I've omitted a lot of direct quotes that could have gone in this episode. Honestly, if you hadn't done that, the episode, would, I mean, it would probably taken us half the amount of time to research. <laughs> I know. So there's one <laughs> like, section. Legit, half of our, our, our time doing this episode was like Sadie editing racial slurs out of. <laughs> yeah. So like I, I want to convey the depths of this man's depravity without just running roughshod over something that can be an incredibly valid trigger for people. There's one section where I'm going to read some lightly censored quotes. I'll give you the heads up before I do. Oh, Ruckman describes two different suicide attempts by ex-wives very callously. I am not going to read his exact words. I am not going to talk about the methods by which they attempted suicide. I'm not going to do anything like that because I want to mitigate the harm from that as well. So Peter Ruckman, tell me about this guy. Quick bio. So Peter Ruckman was born in 1921 into a military family in Delaware. He was raised in Topeka, Kansas. Uh, a lot of the information in this first half comes from his autobiography, which is titled The Full Cup, A Chronicle of Grace. I've supplemented the information in his autobiography with other online sources. I've got all of that in a source post that'll go up on Patreon as usual. But this autobiography, I feel like the accuracy <laughs> of it is my last concern because it says so much about him the way that he chose to describe himself that like whether or not he fudged numbers or dates or whatever this autobiography is an incredibly valuable window into who this guy was ruckman describes himself in this book strangely in the third person <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so when he writes he's writing about himself in a book that he wrote about his own life an autobiography and he'll say ruckman did this or the boy did that or this young man <laughs> But he describes himself as a mischievous kid who got into every bit of trouble that the 1930s had to offer a young man. Moonshine, girls, sneaking into pre-Haze Code movies, and run-ins with the Topeka police. Lots of run-ins with the Topeka police. The way this book is written, <laughs> the entire book, okay? The entire book. All... 310, 314 pages of his autobiography, which I read all of for this episode. Ruckman will write like three paragraphs about his life and then follow that with three paragraphs about what was happening in the world at the time. So he'll write about an event that happened in 1963, and then he'll write a few paragraphs about the Bay of Pigs and the Kennedy assassination and what have you people who were popular in movies, people who were popular in music, politics, kind of all sorts of world events. 
in the most crudely racist way you can possibly imagine. You had a question. <laughs> yeah, the like I'm trying to when I was you'd send me over like excerpts from this book and I would read through them and I was trying to figure out what he's doing. But like I've realized that basically what he's trying to do is he's trying to place his own life within the within like historical context. Right. But not in the way that like, oh, well, this is what was going on at the time, but in the way of the things that he, were happening with him were historical events on par with like the Bay of Pigs invasion. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> right. And and also talking about history gives him a, a format to complain about the things that he really, really likes to complain about, mostly <laughs> Catholics and people of color. Uh, that's pretty much what he hates. So I, I'm, I'm not going to quote a lot of this for reasons I explained in the trigger warning, but I want people to understand that this book is like half about his life and half about the most racist view of American history that I think I've personally ever read. He prints the N-word and multiple other racial slurs with wild abandon throughout this book. I'm sorry, this is, it's, it's a bit outrageous. <laughs> The, the unique thing about Ruckman from the beginning is that he hates Black people way worse than he hates LGBTQ people or women, which is pretty exceptional for IFB hate preachers. Usually IFB hate preachers will hate all three of those groups equally or like queer people hate them a little bit more than anybody else. It's unusual for the racism to overtake the misogyny and the homophobia. Right, because the misogyny is like the bread and butter right. of fundamentalism. And then the homophobia and the racism are like a side effect of that. Almost. Right, right. Uh, he spends more time on racism than I've ever seen a preacher do. So concerning uh, fundamentalism in autobiographies, is it common for fundamental? Like I, we do see a lot of fundamentalist pastors writing autobiographies. Yeah. So it's common to either write an autobiography or have an authorized biography done. Lots of pastors I can think of have autobiographies. Both big name pastors will have one. Also middle-sized pastors who have been in the ministry for like 50 years and want to teach people lessons from their longevity serving God. It's very much a thing. So it's almost like, I don't want to say it's like a rite of passage. Oh, it absolutely is. Oh, okay. It's like, it's, was, just a, it's just a thing that you do when you get either famous enough or you've been in the ministry long enough. Yeah, okay. Because I'm, I'm thinking that there's like a certain level of narcissism that I feel like is required in order to write an autobiography if you're not like a celebrity or if you haven't like gone through a massive or like, and I don't know, maybe I don't really want to pass judgment on anybody who could because there's a lot of great memoirs out there written by just like normies. You know, just but like if you're a mid range fundy pastor, is your autobiography going to be that much different from any other autobiography of like a, any other mid range fundy pastor? No, that's the and the the, the storyline that Ruckman is telling here. I, I was a kid. I got in a lot of trouble. I joined. I was never really saved. I joined the military and that was not great. And then I got, came home and was messed up from the war. And then I really got saved and became a preacher. That is such a common trope. That's like what Mike Warnke did. That's like, yeah, we're, we're, you know. we'll get to that. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, what, because what's the weird thing? And we've said this before, and you mentioned this up earlier. Weird thing about reading this book is that Ruckman is clearly writing about himself in third person, but he also makes it clear that he's the one narrating. So it's like he's watching his own highlight reel and then narrating his own highlight reel. it's like director audio commentary over a movie that he's in. you know what i'm saying yes like i've never read a book that does this before and it just reads like the most insane fever dream i have never encountered this level of narcissism before and honestly it's not even like that i'm disgusted by it i'm just kind of in awe of it <laughs> you know? we're gonna have a lot of those moments the thing that I just have to remember is that you have to be a flaming narcissist to be racist anyway, like in order to in order to look at another person and think in your mind, I know I'm better than that person just by looking at them is definitely a trait of narcissism. And it's also a trait of being a idiot. So two themes that will come back <laughs> a lot. Those themes will come up a lot. Yeah. I mean, like, because he 
he refers to himself as the boy, right? Right. I mean, it's it's like he's he thinks he's like Anakin Skywalker or something. It's just <laughs> like it's clear he wants somebody else to write his autobiography to write his biography but he believes that he's the only person who he trusts enough to write his own biography so he's just writing his own biography at, at, from as himself but pretending to be somebody else but not right. so that he like it's like i wanted a biographer but no biographer could actually write the book that i would have sanctioned so therefore it's me i'm the biography but i'm biographying myself that but or as somebody else <laughs> That or nobody wanted to write a biography of him because he's so terrible. Um, or, it's, it's... or he just couldn't find somebody else who was as willing to put the variety and number of racial slurs into print. It's wild. It, there's so many racial slurs in this book. Yeah, uh, he definitely thinks he's somebody <laughs> very important. He refers to himself as a potential artist, all caps, and quotes... Omar Khayyam before mourning his virginity. I'm wow. not kidding. That's very like I'm this I very will say deep. like he is actually well read because he, he received a a public school education in the twenties and thirties and then a real college education. So he name drops famous authors and quotes famous authors. Um, I remember him quoting Kipling at one point. I know he quoted Omar Khayyam and then there's there was one more now I can't remember who it is. But he tells wild stories about his life. <laughs> Another common thread in this biography is that he emphasizes that he was having sex with a lot of women. Uh, this is from page 89. <laughs> Again, this is written by Ruckman, but he's speaking about himself. Quote, he was what the Bible would call a fornicating whoremonger, like Elvis Presley or Bertrand Russell. His creators, uh, creators he's referring to, movies or American education, his creators would simply have called him a swinger or a man about town or an individualist with a permissive lifestyle or some other hypocritical alibi for protecting a sinner and giving him an air of respectability. <laughs> so that's how he wrote about his young life. Yeah, man, that's... Uh... Ruckman earned his, his bachelor's degree from the University of Alabama, which would normally elicit a roll tide from me, but not in this case. We don't claim him. He married his first <laughs> wife, Janie, after graduating from college. Janie gave birth to his first child, and then Ruckman joined the army in 1944. He was stationed in the Philippines, where he participated in war, racism, and a lot of drinking. He wasn't dealing so well with, like killing a lot of people. So he was stationed in the Philippines where he participated in war, racism, and a lot of drinking. He was not dealing so well with having to kill people for war reasons, and he took refuge in, quote, palmistry. He studied necromancy. He studied black magic and white magic and phrenology and ESP and transcendentalism. He practiced meditation and astral projection. Something was still missing. Did Ruckman just read the Satan Cellar and then say that he studied all of the stuff that Mike Warnke learned at uh, Magic School? Uh, this <laughs> this book was published in 1992, so long after Warnke and Todd were talking about their various journeys through the military and witchcraft. Yeah, but about the same time when that Cornerstone article came. <laughs> yeah, but as far as I can tell. Ruckman was telling the same story before Warnke and Todd were a thing. I would have to wonder if there's a connection. Right, because Ruckman was a fundamentalist pastor for years and years and years and years and years. Yeah, and as we're going to get to, he had a prolific writing career, I guess you could say, as well as Ruckman was also on television and he sold his cassette tapes and VHS tapes around the country. See, that's interesting. I could see world in which Ruckman could be a, a you know we're looking for those intermediary steps between mm -hmm. the protocols and all of that stuff and and Mike Warnke and the satanic panic this could be one of them I mean he, it is the same story I went to war it really sucked I got into all of these demonic religion things to try to make myself feel better that didn't work so I came home after the war and then I got saved 
Yeah, the one thing that I am thinking about is that Warnke would never admit to listening to Ruckman because Ruckman is just too openly racist yeah. for Warren Key to associate. I mean, because like Warren Key is like casually racist, but like Ruckman is just like dropping racial slurs left, right, and like, center, like purposely. all over the like, yeah, just constantly. I mean, Ruckman wrote a book called Discrimination The Key to Sanity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, I have man. a copy. Yeah, guess what year he wrote this book? What year? I don't know, I'm looking. 1994. Whoa! That's like... We were both 30, alive. Yeah, that's like 30 years after I would expect that book to have been written. Yep. <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll get to not that book because that book is too awful to read on air, but we'll get to other things. Yeah. I mean, that sounds like the title of a book that would be written by like Bull Connor or somebody, you know, like... So, like Warnke, <laughs> Ruckman felt really lost when he was in the army. After fighting in the Philippines, he was stationed in Japan after the end of World War II. He claims that he met a young Japanese woman and talked her into coming to America with him to be his wife. For those following along at home, yes, that is the plot of Miss Saigon. <laughs> exactly the plot of Miss Saigon. Oh. When, because he was married, remember? at home to Jamie, his first wife. <laughs> when Ruckman returned from the army in 1948, he settled in Mobile, Alabama, and worked in Mobile and in Pensacola, Florida as a radio DJ. And then he also moonlighted as a drummer for different bands at night. He was still drinking very heavily after returning home in 1948. He doesn't use the term PTSD, but I would feel very comfortable armchair diagnosing this one, the way he talks about his army days and the effects that they had on him. One night, he had reached the end of his rope, and he was considering suicide when he heard a audible voice telling him to get a Bible. Wait, this I've heard this one before. This is the, the Mike Warnke story. Yeah, hearing audible voices is another commonality. <laughs> Ruckman says that he had a series of what I can only describe as magical experiences with the Bible. So he would ask a specific question, then he would close his eyes, open the Bible to a random page, point to a random verse, and then open his eyes and read exactly what he needed to hear. One day, he read a verse. He was using this method, and he came across a verse about being poor and blind and naked. And he scoffed because, well, I'm not poor, I'm not blind, and I'm not naked. This book was finally wrong. Ha <laughs> ha. And then he had his glasses break, a suit stolen, and his wallet stolen on three separate days of the same week. You know, I'm not even questioning if this was a supernatural experience or not. I'm just happy to hear about him having <laughs> stolen. <laughs> this is very much like the, with the fundy thing that we talk about is the, is almost like the magical thinking. Right. Yeah, that is a very fundy-ish thing. So a couple of different times during this period, he had a brief flirtation with Catholicism. I think maybe once before he joined the military and then once after. Um, he met with priests. He was not impressed by them, and he didn't like what they had to say about the Bible. After a while of this, half-heartedly looking for God in the Catholic Church, having magical, mystical experiences with the Bible, and drinking and not living at home with his wife because he was such a horrible husband she literally couldn't live with him, he had an encounter with a Baptist preacher who came into the radio station where he worked to give a sermon. Giving sermons on the radio was very much a thing in the 50s and 60s. For those who grew up fundy, you probably heard a lot of radio sermons by Oliver B. Green and Lester Roloff. I'm pretty sure Jack Hiles actually had his own radio broadcast at one point. But when Ruckman met this preacher, he got saved. And at this point, his autobiography abruptly switches from third person to first person. Wow. Which answers the question of why the first half was in first person or third person. Because he's trying to show he's like, I w this was a different person uh -huh. than the... He is writing as if all of the awful things he did in the first part, well, that was a completely different guy. Now it's me, I, Dr. Ruckman. That was the boy. That's so gaslighty, though. 
Yes. That's really oh, that's really funny. But it's not like he becomes an any better person in the second half because no. he's still just like he's just like I'm still a horrible racist. I'm still but I'm just like Christian now, I guess. So, it's fine. Just just wait. We're going to get into a lot of apologetics based on well, that wasn't the real me. That was that was the <laughs> me before I got saved. We're going to get into so much of that. But the racism never changes. So just a few months after his salvation, he was off to Bible college at Bob Jones University, where his two brothers-in-law had attended. And at Bob Jones University, he earned his master's degree and a PhD in religion. Shouts out to Bob Jones University for giving a PhD to Peter Ruckman, who, (laughs) I mean, I guess as we discussed in our BJU episode at this time, Bob Jones University was fully committed to segregation, white supremacy, and Christian nationalism. Not saying that they aren't still committed to that now, but like officially that was their position. Yeah. Uh, I have a feeling that he liked BJU a lot better when they had a a rule against interracial dating. But tellingly, his official obituary does not mention that he went to BJU. And he's got a lot to say about that in his book. At the time he attended in the late 40s, he says that the professors were, quote, stuffed shirted egotistical hair splitting destructive critics of the king james bible he says that he did not learn a single thing about the bible while he was at bju which does bring up the question of why he stuck around for not one but two advanced degrees he called the school a quote bible correcting a hot house for upper upper middle class kitties but he continued to refer students there for education degrees until at least the 1970s is the Bible correcting hot house thing? Is that like saying, um, it's, I mean, that's like saying you, they aren't like in it for real. They, they aren't like really down with it. They're just like play acting at it. Yeah. That's and he what also, he's saying. Yeah. like Bob Jones University professors, he learned Greek and Hebrew while at Bob Jones. But one of his major problems was that the professors would correct the King James, say, well, if we translated this now, a better word might be. The statements like that. They did hmm. not believe that they believed that the King James was a great translation, but they did not believe that it was perfect. And that was his main issue. Because remember the Bible flipping verse pointing mysticism that he's like based so much of his life on? Yes. If the Bible isn't perfect, that kind of kicks the legs out from under that kind of mystical view of the Bible. Ruckman thought there were two kinds of fundamentalists. The intellectuals like the BJU crowd who didn't know anything about the Bible and used additional versions other than the King James, and the J. Frank Norris Texan fundamentalists who were rougher, considerably more racist, but used the King James only and, in his opinion, actually knew the Bible. Toward the end of his time at BJU and shortly after, Ruckman was traveling as an evangelist and preaching all across the South. He tells big stories of revivals, salvations, and he brags about how much he was learning in his Bible reading. Towards the end of his time at Bob Jones University and shortly after, Ruckman was traveling as an evangelist and preaching all across the South. He tells big stories of revivals and salvations, and he brags about how much he was learning in his Bible reading. Ruckman's first wife, Janie, was not a fan of this, and when he was at home, things were very rocky. Although, they did somehow have four more children during this time. Mm. Which leads me, I I don't think it was Janie's idea. I I mean, I don't Mm. know and will not officially speculate, but he talks about how much she hated him and wanted him to drop out of the ministry all the time. Ruckman takes some of the blame for their marital problems, admitting that his constant drunkenness and cheating probably had something to do with it. He admits that he couldn't imagine anyone having a worse husband than Janie did in the years previous to his salvation. But he also implies that Janie wasn't really saved and complains that she was not open to accepting him back, even though his salvation had completely changed him as a person. So he can't understand why she can't see that he's completely different now and forgive him for the 10 years of abandonment, constant drunkenness, and cheating that he put her through. Yeah, like, this is, I not? mean, <laughs> Jesus forgave me. Why can't you? Right. I'm sorry. Tr- I, I'm sorry to everybody that I triggered by saying that, but like. So this poor woman, Janie, uh, demanded that he get out of the ministry 
go back to his normal life and try to be a normal guy. It's at this point in the book that he talks about two of Janie's suicide attempts by d two different methods very crassly and dismissively. It is genuinely awful to read. Um, he portrays her as not truly Christian, never really saved, and as someone who is trying to get in the way of God's calling on his life. This poor woman finally up and left him in 1958 or 1959, uh, trigger warning for domestic violence. She showed her doctor bruises that Ruckman left on her. So Ruckman is like, well, she told the doctor that I hit her and that was what let her leave, but I never hit her. Ruckman says <laughs> all he did was grab her wrists and push her up against the kitchen sink and push her up against a table. And it's not his uh, fault that she bruises really easily after the birth of their third kid. That's still like, you, you, you shouldn't the, be pushing your partner around. Also, sounds like maybe she had abuse. fucking anemia or something. Like a medical issue. Oh, you know, she just bruised really easily after our third kid was born. Oh, uh, man. So the fact that he left marks on her was what enabled her to actually leave and get out for good. Right, because they didn't have no-fault divorce at this time. You can't just right. break up and say, we, we want to get divorced. This isn't working. Right. This is in 1958 or 59. Right. So she. So now that there's bruises, she can legally go and say, this man mm -hmm. is abusive. I don't want to be married to him anymore, and a judge will allow it. Right. Well, he tried and tried to get uh. her to come back. He actually spent like four years trying to convince her to come back because of the belief that a man in the ministry has to have a wife, can't be divorced, all of that stuff. Janie said that she would come back if he saw a psychiatrist and had a vasectomy. Both of which he said Ooh. he did. <laughs> Jay, I mean, I kind of love Jamie. Janie, you, you kind of gotta stand her. I mean, he should see a psychiatrist and have a vasectomy anyway. But I don't believe that she should ever go back to him. Right. Um. She didn't. Yeah. <laughs> she didn't. Don't worry. <laughs> um. So Ruckman pastored several different Baptist churches in the Southern Alabama, North Florida region. Toward the mid-1960s, this is a quote. Ruckman says, quote, The pressure to start a school mounted. What? Pressure from whom? Yeah, who, who out here? Whomst among us? Even though you're crazy, your wife has just left you, you're trying to convince her to come back, you're incredibly racist, you have a PhD, but you're, by your own admission, a terrible teacher and hate doing it. Well, where is he? He's in Pensacola uh -huh. in nineteen in 1965. So maybe the being hella racist thing yeah. is a point in favor of them wanting to, to cause you know, the, the civil rights the school integration, that's all going on. They're just like, man, we need a private school. Here's a guy who says he's in the ministry. We don't care that he doesn't have a wife as long as he teaches racism, you know? Well, he, they, when he says a school, he means a college for adults. Really? Yeah. So mm -hmm. not just not like a, a, a uh, no man. because Christian children or especially Baptist children in Pensacola went to PCS Pensacola Christian Schools which was already well established by this point actually some of Ruckman's children or stepchildren I think some of his stepchildren attended Pensacola Christian Schools in the early days huh so Ruckman regardless of who was allegedly pressuring him to start a school. He founded Pensacola Bible Institute in 1965 while pastoring at Brent Baptist Church in Pensacola, Florida. Through Brent Baptist Church, he founded the Bible Baptist Bookstore, a mail-order ministry that distributed his sermon tapes, printed his books, his tracts, even his artwork, and distributed books by the few people that he agreed with on anything. I should make a note about Ruckman's artwork. Uh, Ruckman worked in several mediums, but he was best known for his chalk art. And he was not terrible. He would often use chalk to illustrate his sermons as he preached them. And that's, you know, if he were not such a horrible person, that would be kind of cool. That's kind of talented to be able to draw something that makes sense and also speak in a way that makes sense at the same time. I would think it was cool if somebody did that and they weren't like a horrible racist. So Ruckman, he, Ruckman's born in 1921 um, and, he, and he was in World War II. So he's about the same generation as Jack Hiles. Um, yeah, very close roughly. in age. Yeah. Um, and he's getting his ministry started up around the same time as, as, as Jack Hiles is really amping things up at First Baptist Church of Hammond. Does he have 
the similar influence over a certain subsection of fundamentalism or is he at, at this time seen as like a niche crank more like Steven Anderson was or is? I would say it's somewhere in between. Uh, Ruckman definitely had a reputation similar to Steven Anderson, like, oh, that guy's kind of far out, maybe even kind of dogmatic, too dogmatic for the IFB. But unlike, say, Dr. Kent Hovind, the B is for the bargain. <laughs> Ruckman is actually educated, and he could phrase things in a way that sounded very intelligent. We're going to talk. So Ruckman has a real PhD, but right. not He's from not Patriot like... University. He's it, no fake. Do I mean, it's from Bob Jones. So, but Bo but a Bob Jones doctorate in theology, yeah, that's a real degree. Like if Bob Jones gave out a doctorate in humanities or anthropology, <laughs> I'd be a little suspect. But but like no, that's a real degree in theology. No, that's real. We're gonna talk later about how Ruckman saw himself as an expert on absolutely everything. But within the IFB movement, Ruckman was a very respected teacher on the King James version in particular and also on prophecy in the Bible and in times prophecy. So to answer your question of how he was viewed within the IFB, plenty of people thought he was just a quack or offensive or not worth listening to at all. Some people thought he was just fantastic and the best Bible teacher out there and listened to everything he had to say. And then a lot of people fell in the middle, somewhere between those two views. Uh, a lot of, all of my books of his that I have, uh, I looted from my dad's library. <laughs> Sorry, dad, um, for stealing your books. And <clears throat> my dad had told me that he collected them for the comedy value. He was very clear that like, this guy does not have anything worth saying, but, it, but it's kind of funny, the conclusions that he comes to. <laughs> Because a lot of the things that Ruckman says that are like when he says something that's not racist, it's often humorous. Yeah. So th the thing that I have to keep remembering, because because the, the point that we have to keep making about Ruckman is like the racism is the main dish. It is the main course for everything that he's selling here. The thing that I have to keep remembering is that like when Steven Anderson was blowing up in the 2000s, 2010s. It was not socially acceptable to just come out and say blatantly racist stuff and talk about like working women are the downfall of society because basically from the 90s through like I think like 2017, you know, or, or whatever, it would have been seen as pretty abhorrent and universally condemned to, to say stuff that was just blatantly racist and, and blatantly misogynist. But in like the 60s, 70s, 80s. You know, I guess in the 60s, it would have been more acceptable in the 70s and 80s. You'd have shown yourself as part of a pretty of, of like a dwindling group of people, but you'd have had the right audience. You'd have gotten away with it if you were like in the right place right. and in front of the right people. Like when, when John R. Rice wrote his much more nicely phrased book in defense of segregation, the, the premise was not we should have segregation because white people are better. The, the premise was we should have segregation because we should keep these two different cultures in our country separate, which is still racist, wrong, incorrect, but it, it's not as malicious or at least as not, not as malicious at face value as what Ruckman is saying. But Ruckman, I don't think he ever really left the 70s, 60s, 70s in his own mind. And like I said earlier, uh, Discrimination, The Key to Sanity was published in 1994. And it's it's not that surprising that an IFB pastor in the South would be writing a book for the explicit purpose of defending and promoting discrimination in 1994. Yeah, I mean, I guess in 94, the IFB was still operating under the impression that it was 1974. And Yeah. Yeah. So through his Bible Institute, cassette tapes, and books, Ruckman quickly made a name for himself in the King James-only space. Even in his autobiography, he's blatantly dismissive of uh, Pensacola Christian College, Bob Jones University. He name drops them as schools that are too liberal, too soft, don't teach enough Greek, and don't teach enough about the King James Version and why a person should be King James only. His, he, he does not name drop Hiles Anderson nearly as much, although it will come up here and there, which gives me the impression that he didn't hate Hiles Anderson as bad as he hated these other schools. And this was during the fundamentalist heyday of Hiles Anderson. He does not name drop Jack Hiles that I can see, 
although he does criticize Bob Jones II and John R. Rice roundly. So given all that information, I think he hates Hiles Anderson and Jock Hiles a lot less than he hates the Christian colleges, IFP colleges, fundamentalist colleges that are seen as more liberal. Interesting. Okay. This is where Ruckman gets on a rant that he never really leaves about how much he hates teaching. He wants to be a preacher. He wants to be a, a hellfire and brimstone evangelist. He wants to focus on evangelism and converting people. But God was forcing him to be a teacher. So we also have a nice martyr complex here in case the racist martyr complex wasn't enough. Well, he's called to teach. He's called to preach, man. Yeah. The... So his thoughts on the King James Version, what, what does he actually say about it? His thoughts on the KJV center on anti-Catholic sentiment, which is, is one of his other main tangents along with racism. In his writing, he's a lot more Protestant than a lot of IFB guys I knew. He's a lot more willing, for example, to be associated with Martin Luther. Not to be confused with Martin Luther King, because he makes no secret of how much he hates Martin Luther King. Repeatedly. Ooh. Repeatedly. He does get into, I guess, I guess, uh, I guess Ruckman doesn't agree with uh, Lori Alexander. <laughs> <laughs> accidentally accidental queer intersectionality I accidentally, yeah. right. <laughs> so Ruckman does get into like the Alexandrian text Hort and Westcott all of those things that we talked about in an episode a couple months ago but Ruckman's line of thinking is that the Catholic Church is a sat satanic interloper and that all new translations come from the Greek text of Catholic origin, aka Horton Westcott. Therefore, all the new translations are satanic and Catholic. So, to clarify, the mainstream IFB view is that the texts that modern translators work from are bad. So, the translation is corrupt. Oh, and also, the texts that modern translators work from are related to Catholicism and Catholic translators, so it's extra bad because of the Catholicism. Ruckman's view is the translation is related to Catholicism, and that's what makes it bad. Oh, and also, it came from bad texts, and that's the extra bad. So it's that big a deal? Yes. We are going to get into this more in the second half, and I don't want to give too many spoilers. The reason that this is a big deal is that. Ruckman believes that the King James is better and more fully the word of God than the original Greek. So huh. the King James version of the book of Deuteronomy is more faithful, in fact, a perfect, flawless translation of what God spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai than the Hebrew that Moses wrote down or the copy of a copy of a copy of a copy of that that we now have to work with when translating scripture. Uh, you just, you broke my brain a little bit. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm... That's like, that's kind of his, that is his uh... theological hobby horse that all of his work is built upon. Um, yeah. This is the thing that Jack Scott got in trouble for because Jack Scott said, no, that's teaching double inspiration. God inspired his word once when he spoke it to the original authors and then he preserved it throughout generations. And the King James Bible is just another preservation of his word. It's that whole thing. Ruckman started that years and years and years before Scott refuted it. And then Stephen Anderson got mad at Jack Scott over that and started the NIFB. So around 1968, Brent Baptist Church, where Ruckman had been pastoring, suffered a church split. Some deacons didn't like Ruckman's bull in a china shop with attitude and way of doing things. Ruckman says that Bob Jones Jr., who was the current president of BJU, pressured him to resign as pastor, but that this pressure was also motivated by the fact that Arlen and Becca Horton wanted to buy the property at Brent Baptist Church to make it a part of what is now Pensacola Christian College. In this passage on page 240, he calls PCC, quote, an interdenominational sissy school, a billion dollar launching pad for lady fingers. Wow. Can you do like a trans transatlantic radio voice? An like, international uh, sissy school, a billion dollar launching pad for ladyfingers. Yes, perfect. Like that. 
he did not sound like that, but that is how he writes, and that is the only voice I've been able to hear in my head while reading this entire book. What's wrong with Ladyfingers? I don't. Are, are, ladyfingers are like cake, right? Well, you see, like, the, like little yeah. cake cookies. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> you see the quotes, like in my where I've written down this quote in our outline. He has scare quotes around Ladyfingers. He has scare quotes around everything. This man overuses quotes more than I do, which is impressive. Well, you're a good baker. Yeah. You went to Pensacola. Yeah. So, I mean, you, you can make lady fingers if you want to, right? Sure. Never tried. So he's not wrong. Like, it's, it is an inter denominator, is an inter whatever <laughs> launching pad. A billion dollar for, launching pad for lady fingers. Yeah. I mean, you, you do, you do make it. You, I bet you make a good lady finger cookie. Too. You know, I, now I feel like I'm obligated <laughs> to try, even though I did not take any home at, at Pensacola. Yeah, if you go and make good lady fingers, then you'll just be proving everything that Peter Ruckman says <laughs> as as accurate. I think I'm going to stick to what I know and make <laughs> creme brulee. The original dispute between Ruckman and PCC was a property dispute, but they would continue to trade barbs over the King James, the Greek, and the quality of education and the liberal perceived liberal nature of Pensacola for years, pretty much for the rest of Ruckman's life. So at this point in his autobiography, Ruckman says that he had lived without a wife for eight years since Janie left and that he had not enjoyed the experience, <laughs> which, which sounds fair, like, you know, fair. He's been actually uh, being a single dad for a, a majority of that time. And they I think, gave Peter Ruckman custody. Yeah. What the f You know, <laughs> who is running this family court? This is. Some judge in Mobile. I don't fault him for saying that he didn't have an experience he enjoyed as a single dad. Like, people are entitled to feel how they feel about their own experiences. But then he keeps talking. <laughs> so this is also a quote from page 242. The devil had worked me over good on more than one occasion. <laughs> it's very unclear whether he's talking about having committed, quote, immorality by IFB standards or just fallen into, just been tempted to commit immorality. The fact that he makes it so unclear when he's perfectly capable of writing clearly leads me to believe that he committed immorality. Ruckman goes on to say, quote, I saw that I could not continue the way I was going. I needed a permanent help meet. And if I messed around much longer, I would get involved with a married woman somewhere. The <laughs> I can't be single or otherwise I will start having an affair with someone who's already married. Those are the only two options. To be fair, it probably does suck to be a single dad um, like Peter Ruckman. And then he'll just say some <laughs> like this. You're like, no, he deserves it. He deserves <laughs> everything, man. Like some people feel like they're better off as single parents. Some people wish they didn't have to be single parents. There's a range of experiences and people are entitled to feel however they feel about that experience. But committing <laughs> immorality or finding a permanent help meet is, is a false choice. <laughs> See, I also do feel like he probably put that in there just to like wink at everyone and let them know. He's like, just so you know, even though I wasn't married for eight years, I was still f***ing. So yeah. don't like that. That's what he he was like. I want you guys to know I'm still cool. I was cool the whole time. This like, is going to come back <laughs> around, believe it or not. <laughs> so at this point, after blaming... <laughs> women for his own desires he references another work of his own in which he defended his remarriage uh, kind of glosses over like yeah i know the bible seems to say that you're not allowed to do it but actually here's my 47 biblical reasons why it was okay for me to get married again after divorce and the quote continues i decided to remarry the problem was who <laughs> skipping down in the same paragraph <clears throat> I knew she would have to be a young woman because no woman over 40 could keep the pace I kept no matter how lively she was. Damn. I don't know what he was planning on doing when his wife hit 40. This is so stupid. So I mean, that's why dudes like this always end up married multiple times because they're just like, uh, bored of you. Well, as we'll find out in Ruckman's situation, it's because women cannot stand being with him because he is awful. And he's horribly abusive and just, right because yeah. i didn't hit her i just shoved her into the kitchen sink i never hit her so he let the church because he was pastoring at the time he this is actually i think maybe an ethical decision that he made believe it or not 
he led the church to a secret ballot on whether they approved or not of his remarriage. And the ballot came out, according to him, 200 people in support of it, 100 people against it. And he wasn't satisfied with, according to him, he wasn't satisfied with doing something that a third of his church disapproved of and therefore resigned before marrying his second wife, Sherry Rubin, in 1972. Now, I don't know how much I trust his version of the story, but he certainly makes himself out to be ethical there. I think that it's probably that it was the other way around for the the people who supported the, who supported or were against it. Yeah. And he resigned to do it any like if if he'd had gotten the approval, he would have just done it. Let's be real. Like yeah. th that's who this guy is. If if he'd gotten the approval, then he would have just done it. He probably decided to do the secret ballot on he, he was probably urged to do that by somebody else and said, look, you have to do this. Or he took the ballot to... and he was going to use it as a, as an excuse to resign no matter what. That's also... Like, a, that was all it, just part of his plan. Right, because if it was a secret, he could have just made it up. He could have just made the results up. Right. And So he doesn't, like... he, But he could have said... he It could have come back 299 for one against and he could have said well i don't feel right leading one of god's people into something that they believe is sin so i'm gonna resign you know he could have come up with a reason to do whatever he wanted to do no matter what the results of the ballot were but he's really he's really done a great job of making himself look ethical in this situation in uh so he was married in 1972 and then he founded the Bible Baptist Church in Pensacola in 1974. So then after leaving this church, he proceeded to immediately start a competitor church in the same town, which he says grew quickly. There's a historical section between parts of his life story here where he talks a lot about Ireland and how the, quote, Catholic terrorists killed so many people in Ireland, but the news media always backed them up because the Catholics control the media. <laughs> Which I guess is what you believe if you don't believe the Jews control the media. Yeah, I guess I the Catholics control the. That's a new one. I haven't heard that one. Uh, that's oy vey. It's, I uh, could read you Ruckman saying it about forty seven times <laughs> after talking about Catholic terror. So this is also like a section of his book where the historical parts in between parts of his life are still really really racist for the most part. But he's also including a lot of statistics about people getting killed. So he'll say, this, and, and in 1970, this year, there was a tsunami in this country that killed 600 people, and there was an earthquake in this other country that killed 62. And up in this country, there was a terrorist attack that killed 47, and six people were killed in the plane crash in this state. That's an entire paragraph. He will just list a list of people that died and the reasons that they died. And, and he also starts listing dead celebrities around this point of the book. Um, like in this year, so and so died, and in this year, so it's like people he followed when he was a kid or a young person. Just no explanation, <sighs> apropos of absolutely nothing. This is just like what the historical sections in between his life story are like. When he turns to the back to the story of his life uh, after this historical section, he says that his marriage was bad from the start. His second wife. Sherry was unreasonable. She threw things. She ripped up papers that he was typing on. He would, she would pull things out of his typewriter. Uh, she, he says that she attempted suicide at one point and that she complained that he never spent any time with her. He says, of course I spent time with her. I tried to teach her how to play racquetball and golf so that we could have more time together, but she wouldn't even take my advice on how to swing a golf club properly. Oh, man. I do feel that in the absence of being able to hear her side of the story, maybe perhaps the man who was pastoring a church, running a Bible college, reading a book a day every single day, writing a newsletter, and writing and publishing 99 books in like 20-something years, and also traveling and preaching often, possibly wasn't actually spending any time with his wife, unless he had a time turner. Fair. He says... Well, I bought her jewelry and I took her on dates and I did everything that I could for this marriage, but she didn't actually even read her Bible or pray. Uh, hmm. maybe living with Mr. Ruckman is so bad that most people would get depressed and not be able to function and do things that they normally did before their marriage, possibly. Ruckman also says that Sherry wouldn't let him discipline her daughters from the time they were 9 and 11 uh, until they were teenagers at the end of the marriage. 
I don't know what he means by discipline. I do know that I would not let anyone do it to my kid. Yeah, this that sounds like a good uh, uh, call on her part. Yeah, I don't think I need the definition to know that that's the same call I would make. Speaking of which, we do have an episode coming out next week about uh, Michael and Debbie Pearl and to train up a child. Yes. Uh, Poor Gabby. He has just not been exposed to this much uh, terrible things in his life. And Dude, my brain's been fried just from all of the horrible stuff I've had to read over the past month. It's, well, we're recording that ugh. episode in like three days, and then it'll be over after you edit yeah. it. <laughs> it's true. So this is where so we're gonna we're gonna have some quick Nazi stuff here, actually. Oh fun, my favorite. Um you know, it's always best when you can mix several different varietals of racism. Yeah. Uh... <sighs> so Ruckman talks about several trips that he took to Germany. He always mentions going to the Eagle's Nest, going to Hitler's birthplace, and going to see the speaker's platform at the Nuremberg Sports Palace. Uh, he's always very careful to say that he only went to those places to leave gospel tracks in these places of great wickedness. And uh, he mentions that Satan must have got a hold mm. of Hitler very young. He postulates that people in Austria and Germany have poor quality of life because those places are where psychiatry was invented. And he frames his obsession with Germany as an evangelistic desire to see the German people saved. In this quote... Hmm. From page 261. God put me down on my knees for 30 minutes, crying out for Deutschland. Deutschland, Deutschland, Uber, mm -hmm. Alice. That's what he was doing. No, people <laughs> who have a special interest in Hitler, that's always creep. That, that always creeps me the f out. That's always a red flag, no matter what. Like when, when people are almost like reverent. Of his evil you know what i'm saying yeah like i don't know how much you've studied him but the more i've learned about hitler the more i've realized that he wasn't a particularly remarkable person mm -hmm. he wasn't a I, I mean you know people are always well he was a great leader he wasn't a good leader he was a horribly unsuccessful leader and millions of people died as a result and germany basically was split in two and stopped being a country for almost 50 years because of how bad a leader he was he wasn't a great orator he was just a particularly hateful one he wasn't an especially smart or shrewd man in fact he was quite easily hoodwinked by conspiracies and false information it just seems to me like the people who have like a special respect for hitler even like when it comes to to like a, uh, like a special interest in how evil he was it always seems like it comes hand in hand with being the kind of person that desires the same sort of power or reverence that an autocrat of that nature demands. Yeah, and he's, he's definitely kind of participating in that glorification of Hitler, even though he's being very careful to know I didn't support Hitler, but it, that's kind of his tone. Yeah, he, and he's really trying to frame it as a desire to see the German people saved. Like the poor German people got so misled by one evil man, uh, which is really um, not accurate. I, I'm not, I'm no. not going to start. So uh, after a couple Germany trips, his second wife divorced him. Ruckman says that in his first marriage, his first wife Janie tried and tried to make it work with him. But by the time he was finally ready to get himself together, like he got saved, he was ready to be a preacher, he wanted to bring her along with him, she was just not willing to try anymore, and he blames her for not being able to forgive. His second wife, he says, was God's payback, because the roles were reversed. He tried everything he could, but she was obstinate. Uh, this, I, I call b yeah, and, and his second wife did also have one suicide attempt as well, um, which seems like a pattern. That's a horrible pattern to have. That's yeah. like, and like when he talks about these, I I wouldn't dream of quoting it on the podcast. It is he's just so, so flippant crass. about it. So flippant. Oh yeah, she tried to do this and she tried to do this other thing, but she failed both times. Like that's her. <laughs> that's his tone, and and it's it's very not okay. Um. Like that's oh literally God, the type of thing that, that he's saying. 
What? <laughs> Please bleep that. <laughs> I I will believe that, but that's like the attitude that he has. That is no, you're correct. I just uh. it's it's so f- you read this stuff, you're like, what the f-? like? He wrote this out, and then he About, read like, it back. Probably one of these women being said, the mother of his children. Yes, and he he like read it back, and he's like, yes, that's what I want to put into print, and then he published it after Sherry finally divorced him. Ruckman says that even as a man in his 60s, he believed that he would start having affairs if he didn't have a wife, which God, once again, I have sex. And also he's it that says something about what he thinks a wife is for. He immediately remarried Pam, who must have been a pretty tough cookie because she stayed married with him, married to him until his death. Ruckman continued to travel and preach, give chalk talks, write books, and generally piss everybody off until his death in 2016. Uh, Just to sum up a couple loose ends, Uh. Ruckman and PCC slash the Hortons really never got over their feud. Ruckman continued to blast Pensacola Christian College as too worldly, too soft, not real fundamentalists like him. And they fought over minutia of King James only beliefs, even though they were both King James only, they believed it for different reasons. And they fought over that kind of off and on for the rest of his life. Interestingly, so I talked about like what his particular King King James beliefs were, um, believed that the King James is superior to the original Greek and Hebrew texts. Ruckman had a particular talent for making people mad. I want to talk about his longtime beef with R.L. Hymers. R.L. Hymers is a conservative fundamentalist Baptist preacher. He's associated with the John R. Rice camp and is technically an independent Baptist, but not associated with the IFB movement because of his stance on the King James Version. So Hymers is an independent Baptist and he is a fundamentalist, but he is not, he does not associate with the IFB. Hymers believes that the King James is not perfect, it is not double inspired, but it is the only valid Bible because it's the only one taken from the best texts. So it's not perfect, but it's the only thing close to perfect. But because the IFB movement as a whole believes that it is perfect, they won't associate with him. (laughs) The Mm. things that fundies will fight over. Heimers is best known for his large, showy demonstrations against abortion and the movie The Last Temptation of Christ. Heimers was very credibly accused of anti-Semitism, apologized profusely, uh, and was later defended, interestingly, by R.L. Sumner, who is the guy that wrote the article about Jack Hiles in the Biblical Evangelist newspaper that started the Battle of 1989. You remember Sumner. Oh, yeah, I remember him. So Heimers wrote a book in 1998 called Ruckmanism Exposed, in which he stated his beliefs on the King James and accused Ruckman of retooling Seventh-day Adventist ideas about the Bible for an IFB audience. That's a big no-no. Uh, Yeah. Big accusations from Heimers. Heimers also accuses Ruckman of being demon-possessed. Um fair mainly because ruckman himself preached that he was demon possessed and had to do exorcisms on himself in the mirror daily what yep Uh, i found a full pdf of heimer's book so if anyone would like to pick through that uh it's in our free source post on patreon i am at a loss for words right now i i don't remember that detail but you better buckle up for after the break i am just getting started So Heimers also speaks out about Ruckman's teaching of advanced revelations. This is another major point of contention that that Ruckman had with the fundamentalist mainstream. So we need to talk about advanced revelations. So I told you that Ruckman believed that the King James Version was actually superior to the texts from which it was translated that it was more perfect than the Greek and the Hebrew, and that the King James Version was inspired by God at the time of its translation in the early 1600s. Part of the reason that Ruckman believes this is that he said that he had found things in the King James Version that he couldn't find in the original texts. Hidden messages from God that God forgot to put in like the original Hebrew and Greek, but then remembered by 1607. I have a couple examples. 
So this one was quoted in the R.L. Hymer's book, Ruckmanism Exposed. We're looking at Numbers 3352. In King James, the verse reads, Then ye shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you, and destroy all their pictures, and destroy all their molten images, and quite pluck down all their high places. Just to demonstrate the difference in another translation, in the English Standard Version it reads, Then you shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you, and destroy all their figured stones, and destroy all their metal images, and demolish all their high places. So they're talking about idolatry. Right. We destroy their idols. Right. But the word that's rendered as figured stones in ESV is rendered as pictures in King James. Ruckman has decided, had decided before he died, that the word pictures in King James was intentional. A reference to the evils of television, obviously. Oh, God. (laughs) So what Ruckman is saying is that God gave a message to the translators of the King James in the early 1600s that he didn't give to the original transcribers of the Hebrew text of the book of Numbers. And the message that he gave to the King James translators in the 1600s wouldn't make sense to anybody until over 300 years later, but God put it in there to be a warning to Christians of the 20th century. I mean, but that's pretty standard funny beliefs, right? No, not that there's something additional in there. That word pictures is not a great translation of the original Hebrew, evidently. Okay, but how, like, all of these things that are like, this is a message for you now? Oh, yeah. But that's that's all stuff that's in, like, the difference is that Ruckman is saying this wasn't in the original Hebrew, but God inspired it into the King James. The normal fundy stuff, like this is a message for you now, is all stuff that they agree was both in the inspired original Hebrew and the preserved King James. So this is literally a retcon. Yeah. This is literally like, no, like a fan fiction and then retconning your fan fiction into the original. Right. And also racism. Ugh. Um, <laughs> The brown skinned people that god spoke to originally and gave them his words are not reliable enough narrators but the 80 white european men who got together to translate those words in the early 1600s are much better narrators because they were more inspired by god i thought that they believed that people in the bible were white that like moses was white i haven't seen that in ruckman's work yet that's there's definitely people out there who believe that so just like just one more example, there's um in the in the Christian Old Testament Hebrew Bible, the word tablets often appears in conjunction with the phrase jewels of gold as things of value that ought to be sacrificed to God, as in Exodus 35:22 and Numbers 31:50. Other translations other than the King James don't often use the word tablets. Well, now in the 2000s tablets are like an ipad right like an electronic device kindle well ruckman says in another verse entirely that doesn't mention tablets exodus 39 3 references beating out very thin sheets of gold for decorations so obviously when you put exodus 39 3 and exodus 35 22 and number one numbers 31 50 together in a blender that's referring to the thin sheets of gold that are often in electronic devices called tablets. So there's a secret message in the King James Version that was meant to be understood only 400 years after its publication that tells us to sacrifice our iPads to Jesus. Like this is the, if I was really trying to, in bad faith, just make fun of Christian <laughs> fundy beliefs, like like be satirical and take them that extra step of loony, this is what I would do. But he's doing this for real. I'm so confused by this. Yeah, he's doing it for real. And he's basing it on this idea that the King James is more the word of God than the original manuscripts. (sighs) So I do think we should go take up the offering. Um, When we get back, do you want to do more fundy beef? Sure, why not? Okay. That sounds good. Hello, listeners. My name is Casey, host of the Cult Vault podcast, a long-format interview-based show that focuses on cults, high-demand groups, 
captive organizations and more. Each week, I interview a different cult survivor who brings a story of coercion and exploitation along with their own fight for freedom. With nearly 200 survivor interviews from all over the world, you can also find deep dives into infamous cults, interviews with leading experts in the field, and understand more about how cults exist all around us and none of us are safe. Each month, I feature a different author on the show who has penned a compelling memoir about their cult experiences, which we discuss at length on the show, with copies of their books available to listeners. You will never be short of insightful and moving content here at the Cult Vault Podcast, available on all major platforms. Hey, Sadie here. If this is your first time listening to the Leaving Eden podcast, make sure you go back and check out episode 57. It's a primer episode for new listeners. That episode tells my personal story and gives you all the terms and information that you'll need to know going forward. Also, check out our cult true crime series, The First Family of Fundamentalism, so that you can get the whole cult story. If you like our show, you can support us by joining our Patreon, where we have extended and uncensored episodes, as well as other bonus content available. You can also join in the discussion in our Facebook group, that group is called Eden Exodus. Tell a friend, tell a family member, tell your worst enemy. The Leaving Eden podcast is a fully independent podcast, and we really appreciate your support. Now, back to the show. So we are back from our break, and we are going to take a very brief break from the racism to talk about some fundy beef. I love a good fundy beef. We love fundy beef. We Wellington. love fundy beef. It's very, very, very entertaining. I feel like we need like a WWE SmackDown theme for Fundy Beef. You know what? As soon as we make it big, we're going to get a soundboard because I've been bugging you about this since like episode three. Yeah. That's going to be. But then who would offer Next time Dinah summer, makes not... a bingo for our podcast, I guarantee that's going to be on there. <laughs> yeah. Dinah will like periodically make Leaving Eden bingo. <laughs> yeah. Tune into our Pride Month content for more Dinah. Oh, because absolutely. Because Dinah's coming back. Hell yeah. <laughs> So R.L. <laughs> Hyman's was not the only fundy to ever write an entire book about how much he disagreed with Peter Ruckman. Ruckman uh, had articles written about him in the late 80s in both The Sword of the Lord and The Biblical Evangelist, calling him out on different parts of his beliefs. So and, he's really making waves. Yeah, and The Sword of the Lord was the big thing at the time. So if you get condemned in The Sword of the Lord, that's, I mean, that's not like career over, but that's like... I was going to say that's like having a hit piece written about you in the New York Times, but that's no longer a credible publication. No, it's true. New York Times uses poor uh, 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 as, as a bad publication with the way that they refer to LGBTQ people. This is something I forgot to do when we were talking about his book. Maybe we should pause and reflect on the fact that what he admits to doing is cheating being a drunk, domestic, committing domestic abuse, and driving two different wives to the point of suicidality. Like, yes, that's what he admits to in his own autobiography. Just yes, but food for thought. This is also like a Christian culture where saying I was the baddest sinner of them all also gets you like, and, and now I'm saved by Jesus also gets you like extra bonus points. Yeah. But most of that was after his salvation. <laughs> yeah. But you know, I mean, the devil was testing him. He also said that he had uh daily exorcism. He had to give himself exorcisms every day. Right. Like, yeah. He did say that. So that anyway, is, um, I mean, that's like some Bob Larson, multiple demons, uh, 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 multiple demon possession kind of thing going on. Maybe he should just like shack up with Bob Larson and they should just be, yeah. be buds. Yeah. I mean, Bob Larson would probably make him a lot more racially sensitive. <laughs> that's true. Which is really saying something because mm, mm. Bob Larson is not the most ra like Bob Larson is not the most racist fundamentalist. Bob out there. Larson tries and usually fails but i can at least appreciate that there is an effort yeah okay so so <laughs> back to ruckman ruckman had beef with just about everybody who was anybody at the peak of fundamentalism as a movement david cloud is an ifb author and the founder and director of way of life literature a king james only publishing company I did some extraneous looking into uh, David Cloud's beliefs, way of life's associations, 
And it seems like they probably sell their materials to anybody, but David Cloud is extremely particular on who he will and won't associate with. That was a blast from my fundamentalist past right there. So David Cloud um, won't associate with anybody who's not King James only, uh, won't associate with anybody who uses contemporary Christian music at all in their churches, even with the drum beat taken out. But David Cloud also does not associate with anybody who believes in the Baptist bride teaching. In a nutshell, Baptist bridalism is the idea that only IFBs are going to heaven, uh, or only Baptists, depending on what particularly you believe. Cloud also holds a very hardline view on repentance. There's a whole fundy controversy on repentance. I'm going to have to wait and do a whole episode on it because that is way too much to go into on a sidebar. As such a particular person, David Cloud has a reputation for being a bit divisive. Imagine that. I mean, he's like super duper duper fundy. Yeah, like this is not necessarily the church that the church that I grew up in was a, a little bit looser, like loosey goosey than this. But like we associated with people who were this particular. We went to church meetings with people who were this particular. I knew plenty of people who were this particular. And it's almost nostalgic in like a very messed up way. <laughs> I mean, you had the one guy who like who like stormed out of your Christmas service because you played Jingle Bells. Right, the same guy who like officially protested our our Super Bowl Sunday, <laughs> where we had church before the Super Bowl and then watched the Super Bowl together as a church with the commercials turned off so that we wouldn't see any alcohol or immodest dress, and then had church again during the halftime show. But that was worth a protest from this one particular person. <clears throat> is he the same dude that destroyed the toilet? Yes. Yeah, same guy. <laughs> he, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so Cloud's book from 1994 calls out Ruckman for his teachings on advanced revelation, the infallibility of the King James, his multiple divorces and remarriages, and his dispensationalism. Ruckman said that people are saved by grace through faith, Oh, sorry, quick TW for a very brief mention of the rapture. Ruckman said that people are saved by grace through faith up until the moment of the rapture, but those who are saved during the tribulation will be saved by works alone because God's grace is removed from earth. That is a weird dispensationalist teaching that I have not heard anywhere else before, and probably only our former Fundy listeners are going to get that or care, but that is so odd. <laughs> Is it interesting that because that is kind of interesting? Yeah, that's very unique. Uh huh? I feel like my dad would have called that hyper dispensationalism. That's very weird, man. Huh? Ruckman fired back in his 1996 book, Black is Beautiful. Mm. Don't be fooled by the title. This book is not anti-racist in any way, shape or form. This is like a pre-internet clickbait title. Like he titled it that to make it look like, oh, has Ruckman changed his views on all this racist bull he's been putting out for 30 years? It's not about them. But Ruckman called Cloud, quote, an apostate fundamentalist. And then Cloud updated his book from 1994. He re released it, updated it to include even more weird teachings of Ruckman's. I do really love when fundamentalist beef basically is indistinguishable from like rap beef. When they're just like firing diss tracks back and forth at each other. This is basically your obedient servant from Hamilton. Oh, I, haven't, I still haven't As seen well. Hamilton. Yeah. It's, <laughs> this is so nutty, man. Yeah. So do you mind if I ask why uh, he called his book Black is Beauty? Aside from the, the obvious clickbait. So if you look at the cover of this book, I don't have a copy. But the cover shows the title, Black is Beautiful, and the illustration underneath the title is an inkwell filled with black ink that has been turned over on its side, and the ink is spilling out all over the cover. From reading reviews on Amazon Goodreads, kind of piecing together what I can from the internet, it seems that this book is about using the color black as a metaphor for Ruckman's own conspiracy theory about all the, quote, lies we've been told. Lies as in... You know, aliens aren't real. Wait, does Peter Ruckman believe in aliens? Oh, yeah. 
So I want to get into, let's Wait, get what? into, let's get into it. Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> I've never heard Fundy say that, that the aliens are re- like, wait, so if aliens are real, are they Christian? Like, can they be like, could Jesus show up to their planet the same way that he did to ours? This is a thing that Fundy's like to debate about. Uh, um, a lot of times Fundy's believe that aliens are demons. Uh, wait, that I don't know what Ruckman believed. <laughs> Oh my! Okay, on well, specifically I'm... what are aliens, but I can tell you he believed in aliens. <laughs> so, <sighs> okay, so I'm gonna read from Cloud's book because this list is immaculate. This is from page 22 of David Cloud's ebook. What about Ruckman? He's gonna quote a lot of page numbers. The page numbers are referencing Ruckman's book. Black is beautiful. Okay, got it. Got it. Cool. <laughs> So Pete, so this is a quote, quote, Peter Ruckman believes that some of the medieval plagues in Europe were caused by UFOs, <laughs> that a B-52 bomber was downed by a UFO, and that aliens disemboweled the crew, crew members, and that a crew member of a U.S. Navy ship was transported into the future. <laughs> he believes the CIA has implanted brain transmitters in children, old people, black people, and prisoners page 243, and operates underground alien breeding facilities, page 256. He Uh, believes in Atlantis, page 171, and the Bermuda Triangle, time warps, page 160, creatures with one eye, page 173, web-footed aliens, (laughs) blue aliens with blue blood, page 85 and 86, black aliens with green blood, page 244, and gray aliens, with clear blood page 310 through 311 first one i want to say uh peter ruckman unexpected uh, unexpected uh jewish ally in that he <laughs> is blaming the medieval plagues in europe on ufos instead of blaming them on the jews so get a point for that uh, <laughs> but man this is this is great. so he believes in atlantis apparently he, believed but yeah apparently <laughs> the atlantis was like it was always a metaphor no one ever actually believed in it with the story was always like an allegory fundies so i do not know what ruckman wrote about this uh i will not pay for a copy of this book although i may be able to dig one up somewhere my guess uh fundies will sometimes drag atlantis into the worldwide flood narrative and do something with that so that's my guess okay that tracks though yeah that's like like oh there was a worldwide flood but there was a city that was under the ocean and there were there was some air trapped in a cave and people lived down there for a while before they ended up drowning or like like that or there was a city under the water that god allowed to exist under the water and they had pressurized air down there somewhere but god destroyed that too when the flood happened because god killed everybody on earth so like like the firmament Right. That can tie into like the very literal worldwide flood, noetic flood narrative. When we were watching, when do you remember when I watched like 10 hours of Kent Hovind? Yes. One of the many times that I have attempted to. <laughs> dude, uh, that, okay. That dude is just so f***ing entertaining that like it, it's, it, I mean, it's like extremely bingeable content if you're just watching it from like a whole, this is insane. Um, yeah. Yeah. There was one point in one of Kent Hovind's videos where he said that every culture from like around the world has like a flood legend yeah. or like a flood story or a flood narrative. And he's like, this is proof that the flood in the Bible was real. Um, you do realize that Kent Hovind and Ruckman coexisted in Pensacola for a significant period of time. Were they were they like friends? Not that I know of. That's but, we, like, they have so much in common. But they, they both like, have, didn't like, have they also didn't have beef that I know of. So th- three wives. Um yeah. I guess four wives now, Kent Hovind. Um Well, how many has he been legally married to? Two, maybe, if that. I don't two Yeah, like, domestic abuse. Domestic abuse. Um absolutely ludicrous beliefs, but extremely entertaining. Yeah, have like a pet topic that they're kind of famous for, and then the fundies kind of back away from them as they get weirder and weirder. But also, both of them are like guys who they feel like it's their duty to talk about every topic. Mm-hmm. So like, we I, we have to have a position on literally everything. 
Yeah. So speaking of needing to have a position on everything. So as you may be picking up on, Ruckman had a bit of something to say about absolutely everything. We will come back at some point with a full review of one or more of his books, uh, because I think that would be fascinating. But for today, I wanted to, to give more of a smorgasbord <sighs> experience um, and maybe stuff that's that's more fun because like, yes, he's racist. We know he's racist. That is the primary content of his material. But I also want to make fun of his beliefs that are like more harmless and more stupid. So and I also want to make fun of his racism, because I think if you're like literally to be racist, you have to be a idiot. Right. You have to be a stupid person to be racist. Right. But <laughs> so I just I randomly flipped through some of his books that I happen to have on hand just to, to kind of see what turned up. So the first one I looked at is called Music and Musicians. Oh, this but, looks fun. What, what What's he got to say about this? So does he say does he say rap isn't real music? Oh, yeah. A la ben Shapiro. Well, well, yeah, he, he <laughs> says that. So basically, he says that. <laughs> no good music or art has happened since 1918. What? Yeah. Really? Yeah. So the book Music and Musicians is trying to Why? be a complete history of music. I don't know. Uh, Ruckman says that almost all great music was <laughs> written by white men. So here's a two for one misogyny and racism from page 32. The world's smallest volume is famous women composers. Right next to it would be famous black orchestra conductors. I mean, that's an argument for greater representation within, um, right? Like, like if you've ever gone to like a, a a university, like I went to school originally for music was what I was going to school for. Uh, me too, music ed. Right, and when you get to a, a university and you're like, okay, here are your professors. You know, there'll be. Sometimes the conductor will be a woman. It's more often a choir director that's a woman rather than like an orchestra conductor. But not like nine times out of ten, it's an old white guy that's your conductor or is your like composition professor. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like that that's the thing, you know, that yeah. this is an argument. Maybe our you it's, know, maybe not, his it's not because women and people of color can't conduct music that's not why <laughs> so okay so here's this is maybe this is still racist obviously because it's ruckman but this is maybe a little more interesting because this is his um this gets more into his like weirdo numerological theories this is from page 31. according to all authors of musical history the musical scale used by man before 3000 bc was the pentatonic scale James Galway and William Mann say this is the scale used in rock music, but rock music is associated with death, all caps, disease, drugs, abortion, fornication, rebellion, and sex perversion. Do you know what a pentagram is or what the pentagon is? Penta is five. <laughs> Look at Genesis 5-5. Five, five. That is where the first human being died, all caps, according to the only thoroughly objective documented scientific textbook, all caps, on the history of mankind. May Day means a crash is about to take place. May is the fifth month of the year. The international SOS distress frequency is 500. The breakdown of a ship in water is breakdown number five. On a five by five altar, more than 50,000 animals met their death between 15, 1500 BC and the time of Christ. When Christ dies, he receives five wounds after being stripped of five pieces of clothing. Look at Acts 5 5 and then check every chapter number five in a King James 1611 authorized version. Five is the number of death. Then he goes on to point out that. Satan, devil, and death all have five letters as well. So does Santa. Therefore, the pentatonic <laughs> scale. I am pretty Wait, sure Jesus Ruffin has wins. five letters. Hold yeah, up. Hold weird, up. Weirdly, he doesn't bother to point that out. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I would assume that Ruckman's not a fan of Santa Claus. So Peter has five letters. Holy sh this guy's name has five letters. So five is the number of death, and therefore the pentatonic scale is evil. So also, whenever you're watching like a, a like a TV show like Law and Order, um, and there's been like a murder, and they have to call a phone number, and like the police officer's like, "What's the name of the roommate who last saw him alive?" It's always starts with five five five. 
<laughs> wow. You just added even more to this absolutely wacky oh conspiracy theory. Yeah. Oh, man. So, okay. So, so, so uh, that maybe illustrates more like what he's doing when he's, when he takes like a 30 second break from, be from being incredibly racist. Um, more insights from this book on music and musicians. Yeah, the thing that he's saying about the the pentatonic, because the thing that he's saying about the pentatonic scale is kind of correct, but not entirely correct. Because like, I mean, the pentatonic scale is probably the most commonly used scale in all in almost all music around the world. Um, in in Western music, in like rock music and blues music, also very heavily used in like Chinese music. Yeah. However. He declines to to point out that there are many musical traditions, uh, particularly like um, in, in South Asian music that don't even use the same sorts of scale patterns that we, that we use. They use like quarter steps as well. He gets into that, actually. Really? Yeah, I skimmed huh. this book and did not read all of it. So I don't think I'm going to be able to find where it is. But as musicians, maybe this would be a good book to come back and do a full review on. He does also quote Kiss in this book. Hell yeah. What song? God of Thunder. So I don't know that one. Uh it's it's one of Gene's solo songs. It's usually sung. I think it's the one he does right after he spits the fake blood. Oh, usually. okay. So it makes sense that that uh that Ruckman would yeah, yeah. be paying attention to that one. Yeah, okay. So we this may be this may be the book that we should come back and review because there is you know, I generally have a stance of racism is boring, not that it shouldn't be called out wherever we see it, talked about, fought, etc. Just that I find it so dull because it is an endless repetition of the same lies, the same bad science, the same bull over and over again. I agree with you. It's boring. It's the same. You're just going to repeat what somebody else said, the same conspiracy theory, the same lie, the same junk science. So I want to talk about, so this book has more interesting, more original conspiracy theories, and I find that a lot more fun to talk about. And of course, it's also got, you know, the racism to stand up against it and fight against and call out and all of those other things that are completely necessary to do. And also you and I have a a good enough understanding of music and music theory that we could actually and, and and music history as well yeah and the majority of this book is music history i have like a couple other little teasers from this book ruckman says that handel was a great composer his writing proves that he was a protestant at heart even though he was maybe not <laughs> legally <laughs> and that he was a, a saved man and that Handel's music is 95% pure. I find What's the other 5% just like I don't I don't know. <laughs> I Maybe find... it's like Everclear where you know you can't get it past as like if it was 100% right. pure then he would be Jesus. So it's got to be 95%. Like you can't have Right. Like Everclear is as distilled as they can make alcohol like and and still have it be like liquidly stable. I also really don't like the term pure getting thrown around in regards to music in a racist book on music that gives me the ick i don't like the term pure being thrown around in music anyway because pure just is like usually what people say when they're just talking about like vibes that they feel from something like you can just be like it's like the you know when somebody calls them oh that derivative like yeah. when somebody calls some music like when they're just trying to be like a hipster jerk and be like i don't like this music uh because i don't like it but then they try to back it up with like a, a more like intellectual point to make themselves sound smarter than they actually are rather than just say yeah i just don't really like this song yeah they'll just be like no this is derivative all music is like, derivative there is a very large facts. but finite number of combinations in which a person can put notes and rhythms it is a very large number of potential combinations of notes, harmonies, and rhythms, but it is a finite number. And you'll notice that people who are really, really, really good and really influential will wear their influences on their sleeves and will yeah. say, this is where I, I took this influence from and recontextualize this idea that somebody else had, and they'll be very open about it. If somebody's mm -hmm. like saying, oh, I didn't take that from anywhere, it's all from me, that's always 
So moving on, um, Ruckman says that Mozart was a Catholic, but probably got saved as a child, as most most Catholics of the time did. Um, Ruckman couldn't handle the idea that Mozart wasn't saved, um, so he retconned <laughs> Mozart's salvation. Uh, Ruckman said, don't listen to Mozart's operas because they're immoral, because he consulted with wicked people who told them his their life stories, and then he made operas out of them. But everything else he wrote is good music. I would really like to know if Ruckman was aware <laughs> of some of Mozart's songs. <sighs> uh, Mozart was a... Any in particular? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, one in particular. <laughs> um, Mozart was a, a real dirty man. Like, like, in a funny and consensual way, as far as I know, from the stories that I've read so far. But, um... Well, you know what this is like? Because cause he... It, it seems like he's just picking composers he likes, and he's being like, I like this guy's music, therefore he must have been saved. Right, and he likes so few people, as we will get into. <laughs> you know what this... You know what this is like, though? This is very much like the whole thing where people will be like this i had an emotional connection to this artist's music therefore when they got accused of xyz thing there's no way they could have done it because i had an emotional connection to their music like right. that's the that, like and then people have to try to reconcile with that but peter ruckman just doesn't try to reconcile with that he's just like nope guy must have been saved because his songs slap like right. <clears throat> it's, you know if if like if you're a fan of rock music as I am, as Sadie is, you know that some wild shit went down in the 70s and a lot of people who are considered greats of rock music did a lot of very creepy and non-consensual and definitely illegal things with women who were below the age of consent, girls who were below the age of consent, like people who we look at now as being legendary musicians and are just like the godfathers of this genre all did that yeah are we gonna say that they're they were absolutely like they did nothing wrong no jimmy page never did anything with any girls who were 14 years old that absolutely could never have happened ever in a million years like yeah who was it that married his 14 year old cousin without uh jimmy the Jerry, Lee Lewis. Jerry Lee Lewis, yeah, the piano guy. So I'm going to throw a, a couple other pieces at you. Um, oh, God. On page 112, he takes some shots at Tchaikovsky. Uh, here's the quote. Why? The kickoff for this body music among the classicists came from a Russian sex pervert named Peter I. Tchaikovsky. Tchaikovsky's a, a, a sex pervert, but Mozart isn't. But Mozart isn't. <laughs> Mozart <laughs> Um, so there's a there's a lot of the curse of Ham, three sons of Noah, all races are descended from the three sons of Noah kind of stuff in here. He he gets into a rant on sports that continues for like twenty pages, talking about how people of color have replaced white men in sports and comp comparing that to music. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and that goes on for like a solid 20, 30 pages. And then he finishes up the book by talking about contemporary Christian music and uh, sending just a volley of shots at Pensacola Christian College, BJU, and Liberty for being too liberal in their music. Yeah, uh, uh, Peter Ruckman is clearly one of those guys who's like, <laughs> the NBA, the, man, that mm -hmm. it's not good now that they don't focus on the fundamentals anymore. Like <laughs> Yeah, that's that's kind of what that's a the vibe. Drip. I do what think that's absolute the absolute chud. That's the one that we need to go back and do a full review on because there's a lot more material. I want to move in the section where he said that no that that black people made music worse. Is is that this section? Which section? No, Gavi, that's the book. That's the whole book. <laughs> Cuz that's objectively false. That's that's so ludicrously false. Yeah. You know, it's occurring to me now that we should post screenshots of some of his books on our social media, but that yeah. I am going to need to go through and censor them. We got to move on. But, we got to move on to um, 
the book <laughs> Art and Artists. Um, God. Which is a much smaller volume, which is a little odd to me, considering that Ruckman was an artist. Um, this starts off really interesting. So, so here's the thing. His whole theory is, I'm just going to, I'm actually going to read the very first paragraph of this book. There are three great creative functions of the male, which he uses as a substitute for his inability to be the mother of all living. To compete with the female, he creates three exercises known as art, music, and literature. So this is, this is one of his like pet theories that men are jealous or AMAB people are jealous of AFAB people's ability to grow a child with their body and compensate for that, that lack of ability by mm -hmm. creating. And what men create is art, music, and literature. That is, I mean, he's almost like telling on himself a little bit here yeah this is very weird because like never once in my life have i been like man i wish i could get pregnant yes you know <laughs> and that's the experience of life. of a lot of people regardless of <laughs> the organs that they have a oh lot and like a lot of afab people feel the same way as you <laughs> and a lot of people God. a lot of people in general do really wish that they were able to get pregnant and carry a child. Some of us are lucky enough to get to fulfill that. Well, Peter Ruckman himself is an artist, uh, uh, like a, a painter or whatever. So clearly, I don't know, man, maybe like th this is that th this. <laughs> Here's another very interesting thing from the first paragraph of Art and Artists. He repeats his joke from page 32 of Music and Musicians. So this this like uh, this joke about the smallest volume in the world would be the volume listing all the famous women composers. He repeats that here on page one. Three of the world's smallest volumes would have to be great women composers, great women authors, and famous women painters. There's a lot of great women authors. Here's his next sentence. Grandma Moses and Mary R. Reinhardt are no comp competition for the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel or all quiet on the Western Front. I mean, that depends on your like opinion right that's like so, but maybe <laughs> i do think this is interesting because it does show how he managed to write so many books because he repeated himself and the more that i'm the more that i'm flipping through this and reading this just a copy pasta yeah the more i'm realizing oh he repeated himself constantly and that's how he put out so much content uh his thoughts on art he hates all modern art he hates most art <laughs> some of his thoughts this this book is an entire book about all of the artists that he hates and honestly i did not read the whole thing i would like to at some point however i was not able to find him mentioning any artist that he liked in my very quick skim <laughs> some of the people that he hates are matisse and suzanne um matisse's sense of proportion is that of a blind man is one quote That's the point it's impressionism right Cezanne uh so here's what he has to say about Cezanne Cezanne was a pioneer in the debasement and defilement of art and his successors Picasso defiled and defaced it further Cezanne's colors are muddy his compositions are not balanced and his famous sense of eye level and multiple perspectives were just as alibis for not being able to reproduce what he was looking at that's the point of impressionism is that it doesn't like <laughs> Uh, he hates like all modern art, all impressionism, everything. He also hates Van Gogh. He says that Van Gogh is elevated by the media because the system wants every teenager to be like him, like i.e. have mental health struggles. Um, that's surprisingly similar to what everyone's saying about, oh, they're promoting this stuff on TikTok and now every kid thinks mm -hmm. that they have, uh, that they're neurodivergent. Well, <laughs> uh, you know, if it quacks like a duck, like... Yeah. Come on, man. He goes into like a, a he starts off into like a vast political rant about like things that he considers unacceptable got into motion pictures and then they started happening in real life. And that's a problem. So we shouldn't show things in art that we don't want to have happen in real life. And like how so and then then it's just like a political rant for a while. I have one more <laughs> astute criticism by Ruckman on a particular artist. Da Vinci is probably the most overrated, overpublicized, overvalued painter who ever lived. That's from page 61. I mean, what, that's f***ed. 
fucked up thing to say, man. Yeah. Dude, dude, dude literally like that dude literally like changed the 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 I mean, that's like when people are saying, oh, dude, the Beatles are overrated. That like the just oh, like dude literally had like so many techniques that like literally invented by these people that like oh my god this is just like what a hater so, this dude is yeah. such a fucking hater yeah this the entire art and artist book i got in and out quickly because it's just all the things he hates and that's kind of depressing and there's also just like so much racism and misogyny and i feel like we've gotten into kind of a dark place <laughs> in fact we've gotten so dark that steven anderson would feel like a bit of an old faithful pick me up at this point <laughs> and a nice change of pace so I was wondering if you would go ahead and tell us about Ruckman's last great Fundy beef. So surprisingly enough, Peter Ruckman's beef with Steven Anderson is over replacement theology. So Steven Anderson is a, a it's basically Steven Anderson's bread and butter. And we have a more extended discussion of what replacement theology actually is in our uh, Steven Anderson episodes uh, from like two years ago. Jesus, it's been that long. But essentially, replacement theology is the belief that because the Jews did not accept Jesus as the Messiah, God decided that they were no longer his chosen people and that the Christians are now the chosen people. That That's replacement theology. It's, it's basically a core belief of the NIFB, of, of Stephen Anderson. It's important to note this is not a commonly held belief within Christianity or evangelicalism. This is absolutely a fringe belief. The places where I've heard this are basically from Steven Anderson. I've heard this from like some of those like weird and ultra hateful hardcore fringe tradcaths that you run across on the internet sometimes. And even more weirdly, I've heard this from like black Hebrew Israelites as well. Ruckman called out uh, uh, Steven Anderson by name in a chapter of a theology book on the book of Daniel, specifically, he said how terrible and dangerous replacement theology is and how terrible and dangerous Steven Anderson is for promoting it. That, that I mean, that's... Is that an accidentally woke take? Yeah, because the, the thing is, like, whenever Ruckman is talking about, like, Steven Anderson, I'm just like, he's like, sounds sane. He sounds like a person who can form a coherent thought. Steven Anderson, however, is not one to catch strays and, and just take them lying down. So he, of course, has some stuff to say about Ruckman. And in, in one clip that I heard, Steven Anderson talks about Peter Ruckman being crazy. And, and Anderson, in this clip, just like how when Peter Ruckman's talking about Steven Anderson, he sounds like a sane person. When Steven Anderson is talking about Peter Ruckman, he sounds like a sane person. One of his issues with Peter Ruckman is that his inter interpretation of the, you know, the verse where it says the worm dieth not when he's talking about hell. Yeah. So Ruckman apparently says that worm means soul in that passage, mm -hmm. which I don't know. I'm not too big into like the sequel. I don't really con concern myself with those books too much. But then he goes on and lambasts uh, Ruckman for being on his third wife and still pastoring a church, which fair criticism and lambast Ruckman for bragging about how two of his wives have attempted varying degrees of self injury. Also a very fair criticism. And one we made ourselves. Indeed. One we made ourselves. Sadie, how do you feel knowing that you agree with Steven Anderson? Ouch. <laughs> that was, that was a low blow. Gabby. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, the big source of the beef from what I can tell is that Ruckman says that abortion is not murder because when the baby draws breath for the first time, that's when God breathes life into it, which huh. oddly enough is a, 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 like a, a Talmudic belief from, from that, that is a belief that I believe comes from, uh, from Orthodox Judaism. So Stephen Anderson, very clear. Uh, that's, I guess, probably another reason why Stephen Anderson probably takes an issue with it because huh. Peter Ruckman, I, like, I mean, on one hand, yes, Steven Anderson is, is going to be pro-life to the point of being pro-death. And if you die, you die. You know, that's kind of Steven Anderson's take on, um, on 
abortion. I wonder if maybe the reason they sound so much more sane when they're taking shots at each other is that they're fighting over real things. Like when you get into the IFB fighting over King James inspiration or the meaning of repentance or things like that, those things are self-defined. The need to have a perfect Bible in English is self-defined by the Bible. The meaning of repentance is only relevant within one's religion, and there's no real-world relevance. But when we're fighting over interpretation of specific words, well, those English words mean something in the real world, outside of the Bible, outside of religion, when we're fighting, like when we're fighting about whether worm means soul. And the Greek word that that was translated from has a meaning. So, or if you're fighting about um, abortion or replacement theology, those are closer to real world issues. Those are real world issues that affect real people, unlike what is the meaning of repentance and what part does repentance play in salvation. So maybe that's why they, maybe that's why they sound sane because they're talking about real things. The thing that I'm, because I listened to a couple clips of Steven Anderson in like researching this beef with Ruckman. And I like in listening to Steven Anderson speak, I'm shocked that like the right wing podcast bro media sphere hasn't like found Steven Anderson yet because he is like indistinguishable from them. Like I could absolutely see if he was talking about issues that weren't like his trademark uh, burn the infidels issues. Like if he wasn't actively advocating for uh the death penalty for lgbtq people then i could see some like podcast somewhere where people would just be like you know this guy's really interesting he has he has an interesting take on these issues you have to you have to respect him from an intellectual person like you know what i'm saying how people do with that like he could have like a biblical truth influencer status in like a andrew tate style following and like the in like he would be a can biblical we... truth influencer in like the way that andrew tate is a masculine can we not speak this into existence i am getting nervous yeah okay so we 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 talked about the last fundy beef i want to back up no, to... you know what you would get you would get people saying like show me one place where steven anderson's ever said anything homophobic racist or anti-semitic i bet you can't because you have nothing to go off of and it's like (laughs) once again i'd like to not speak this into the world that's what you see people saying on twitter and reddit that's (sighs) but you know that's what they would do so we talked about the last great fundy beef I want to back up to actually like 30 years before Ruckman's death because he had his last beef with Steven Anderson was in the last few years of his life. But I want to talk about one more of his major controversies just for fun. Uh, Ruckman raised a bit of a stink among fundamentalists for his attempts to predict the rapture. Um, We are going to be talking in in very general terms about like the rapture, premillennialism, uh, the tribulation, a little bit of dispensationalism, that sort of thing for a minute here for those who need to know. Ruckman's belief was that since the scripture says a day to the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day, and since God established the seven day week, and since the millennium comes seven years after the rapture, which is a thousand years of Jesus reigning on earth, that means that the rapture has to come 5,993 years after creation. Because a day to the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years as a day, and God made a week, and God does everything in multiples of seven, and the millennium will be the seventh day, or the seventh thousand year period. Therefore, creation can only last for 6,000 years, and the rapture has to come seven years before those 6,000 years are up. So, He did some math with the genealogy of Jesus in the Bible. He determined that there were 2,000 years left to go on that 6,000-year calendar after Jesus' birth. And then he fiddled with the calendar to try to account for the fact that Jesus was likely born in about 4 BC, by the way we count time. And then there's also the seven-year tribulation, and then the Gregorian calendar messed things up. So with all of that information, Ruckman predicted that the rapture would occur between May 14th, 1989 and June 20th, 1989. I mean, his logic sound, I, I find no <laughs> fault with it. <laughs> uh, 
think Homer did a better job. Yes. <laughs> so Ruckman believed, as most fundamentalists at the time in the late 80s, that the date of the formation of Israel as a nation would have something to do with the rapture, that it would happen within a generation of that time. There's a scripture verse, like the, the generation that sees Israel become a nation again will also be the generation that sees the rapture. Ruckman also, for reasons I was not able to track down or understand, believed that the rapture would take place roughly 50 days after Passover in whichever year it happened. I don't know where he got that. I, I mean, I guess we're coming up on that being disproven, right? Right. So yeah, Israel became a nation in 1948. This was a common belief when I was coming up in fundamentalism. The question is, what is a generation? So originally, even according to Ruckman, a generation is 40 years, which is a number that they pull from a scripture verse somewhere. So they thought it would come by 1988. And then 1988 came and went, no rapture. So they had to redefine generation. So then when I was a kid, a generation was 70 years because Psalm 90.10 says the days of our years are three score and 10. So scripture sets 70 years as a lifestyle span. So that would have put the rapture happening before 2018. And I was out by 2018. But I imagine they've kind of gone to their backup plan, which was saying that it would happen before the last person who was born before Israeli independence dies. So the rapture has to come while somebody who was born before May 13th, 1948 is still alive. Yeah, I mean, we're because that's the thing we're I don't want to say we're coming up on that being disproven. But we're in because, the last days, Gavi. Yeah, I mean, because that was like 75 years ago. This year is going to be 75 years since 1948. So, funny math. You guys still have like a couple decades left to go. Uh, please so, don't just like decide, nope, it's now and nuke everybody. Or just read the book of Revelation and realize that it's not real. Um, yeah. <laughs> interestingly, there was this guy named Edgar Wisnant. I'm sorry, I don't know how to say his last name. I'm taking my best guess. Wisnant was the author of a booklet with many names. The booklet was originally published as Rapture Rosh Hashanah 1988 and 88 Reasons Why. He notably misspelled Rosh Hashanah in the title. Um, subsequent editions were titled 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Could Be in 1988, 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Is in 1988, and 88 reasons why the rapture will be in 1988. <laughs> he really struggled with that title, apparently. So Ruckman did not take sides with this guy who was like famously popular for writing these booklets. Um, Wisnant was really fixture Wisnant was really fixated on the rapture coming on Rosh Hashanah for some reason. Ruckman's guesses were always based around like it'll be X days after Passover. So sometimes he would say 50 days after Passover, or he would say three days before Passover or three days after Passover. So all of his guesses had to do with Passover. All Wise Nance guesses had to do with Rosh Hashanah. Nobody tells us why. Um, <laughs> Ruckman was always very clear to label himself as guessing the date of the rapture because Wisnant had this reputation for being a date setter who specifically wanted to predict the exact date. Ruckman thought it was foolish, that's a quote, to attempt to say a specific date or specific time, but for some reason he thought that guessing a range of a few weeks was totally fine. Well, I gotta be with Ruckman on this one because the Bible does say that nobody knows when it's gonna happen, not even Jesus. Right, and that's the verse that Ruckman quoted to say that Wisnant was, <laughs> was being unscriptural and trying to set a date and time, even as Ruckman was <laughs> giving a, couple, a range. I don't understand the difference. So Ruckman had a failed guess in 1989, another one in 1990, and then he re-guessed the rapture for being in May of 1993. Hey, that's when I was born. Yeah. That's my, you know what? Maybe according to Ruckman, I am the second coming of Jesus because I am a Cohen. Um, I suppose we'll and... find out in a few more years when you turn 33. <laughs> um, hey, yeah. just like do me a favor and don't start a grassroots political activism thing and then like let people say that you're the king. Because I would be pretty bummed out if you got executed by the state. I would also be bummed out about that. Ruckman made one more prediction for May of 1997. And then when that one didn't happen, he admitted in 2002 that he was just not going to be able to guess the rapture act accurately. He consistently blamed Pope Gregory for having messed with the calendar. 
<laughs> His quote on why he kept getting the rapture wrong was, obviously something is screwed up and it's not me and it's not my theology. Why doesn't he just use the Hebrew like the lunar calendar? Because that, I mean, that's the one that God uses. All of these guys were like trying to sync the Hebrew calendar with the Gregorian calendar, but couldn't figure out how to do it. <laughs> Why not just use the Hebrew calendar to predict like the day and then when you get like a date, translate that into Gregorian? Because like the worst thing that like if you really miscalibrate it, the worst thing that can happen is you, you could be off by like a month. But like if you say it's going to be 89 and it doesn't happen in 89, then you can't blame that on the calendar. Like that's like scoring your own goal in soccer, like scoring an own goal in soccer and then blaming your shoes. <sighs> I, they just didn't know how to use a calendar. <laughs> so can't count. I want to talk about how Ruckman fit into Fundy history. What might he have influenced? What the heck does all of this mean? So there are a couple points of influence I think I noticed from Ruckman. One thing is the something to say about everything. I have to have an opinion on everything bit. So like I said way back in the beginning of this episode, some people loved Ruckman, some people hated him, but there were a lot of people in between who thought that some of his teaching was good and some of it was trash. I think this is also a thing that's migrated from fundamentalism because it like migrated from fundamentalism to right wing talk radio mainstream now that like every celebrity or or commentator has a podcast now and all of them ha like kind of shoot from the hip on every issue. It, but it's interesting that this idea can be traced back to Ruckman. Ruckman wasn't the first to do this. He wasn't the first to do anything he did. He was not the first guy to get torn up emotionally by World War II, come home, find Jesus, suddenly become a preacher, build a lifelong career out of his conspiracy theories. But he was part of a major wave of that kind of preacher, part of, part of a movement. And I think he was part of a blueprint for how guys become preachers. He wasn't as famous as Jack Hiles or John R. Rice or other prolific writers, but he was controversial. He was well-known. And I think he was a bit of a trailblazer. I think he was one of the guys that carried the torch of fundamentalism out from J. Frank Norris and was a bridge to get J. Frank Norris to modern day. So talking about like the 80s or the 90s. I think he was one of those torchbearers of fundamentalism. That's interesting because like his origin story is almost like a trope at this point. Yeah. It's... So if his origin story is a trope, it are maybe some of the other things that he did also tropes within fundamentalism is what I'm asking. Yeah. So one thing I noticed, all of these advanced revelations that Ruckman claims to have found in the scripture, all this stuff about UFOs and CIA mind control trips in Atlantis and what have you, those are all things that he claimed to have found in the scripture in the King James. And while most of the people that I grew up with kind of soft rejected Ruckman, I think maybe this one thing is something that bled over into mainstream IFB practices. Because I heard plenty of people talk about, oh, I'm not, you know, I'm not a Ruckmanite. I follow God, not some man. I think that, you know, Ruckman down there, he just, he's off the rails. He's crazy. But I also heard plenty of sermons, especially at church camp by one particular pastor <laughs> who I will decline to name because he seems to no longer be pastoring, I checked, that encouraged finding answers for nearly every detail of how a person should live in the Bible. If Ruckman was finding aliens in the Bible and the mainstream IFB was finding biblical truths for exactly how long your skirt needs to be and taking verses out of context and finding numbers in the Bible and making them mean something, could that have come from Ruckman? Well, it's kind of like music, like how, how there could be one genre that's diametrically opposed to another genre, but then they'll take influences from each other. Yeah, and I wonder if this could have been one of Ruckman's influences on the more mainstream IFB. That's wild. So a second ago, I said that people soft rejected Ruckman. And I want to explain what I mean by that, because I think that's another one of his influences. Again, there were plenty of people who came down hard on him, who said he wasn't qualified to pastor because under IFB teaching, his multiple divorces and remarriages do mean that. There were plenty of people who called him a heretic and came down on his theological views, especially his dispensa dispensationalism. 
But despite all of that, and despite all of his detractors, he had a ministry, he had a financial backing, he had a church to be associated with, and he had very strong supporters all the way until his death in 2016, and even still has supporters now, which seems like a ridiculously long time for somebody that racist to continue living. But I think this like soft cancellation or soft rejection may have been another influence he had on the IFB movement. There's a prevalent line of thought in the IFB that still benefits men like David Hiles. That line of thought is, well, he's made some mistakes, oh, he has some crazy teachings, but the bulk of his work is good. God can still use him. Oh, I won't read anything he has to say about prophecy because he's too dispensationalist, but I'll read the rest of his Bible commentary. His Bible commentary on Psalms is really good. The IFB is a loosely affiliated movement of churches more or less in fellowship with each other. One of the biggest drawbacks of it not being a formal denomination is that it cannot expel or censure members. I would think that Ruckman's blatant racism would be enough to have him expelled from any denomination. I would also think and hope that his callous manner of speaking toward not one but two former wives' suicide attempts would be enough to have him expelled from a denomination. And that brings me to wonder if the IFB's chilly tolerance of Ruckman as a sort of weird uncle character didn't influence the tolerance that the IFB now shows towards other racists and predators and other, well, he has some odd beliefs type guys in general that still had standing in the IFB when I was growing up. See, that is odd because on one hand, I've seen Christian fundamentalists get really nitpicky about who they associate with based on extremely niche beliefs. But on the other hand, this is very much just like, well, I don't really have a lot to say about that. Like it's, it's uh -huh. almost uncharacteristic. Yes. And did the way that Ruckman was treated by fundamentalists pave the way for how other men are treated by fundamentalists, I think is the question I'm asking. That's, I mean, that's really interesting because there's other religious traditions where it's, extremely taboo to openly condemn another follower of the same uh, of the same tradition no matter what bad thing they did like it's just socially not done it's very taboo this almost feels like that it's just weird to see it coming from the fundies yes and of course i am just speculating but i i wonder if ruckman's unique position within fundamentalism had anything to do with that trend now yeah, that's really something to think about. Um, and that that's, I think that's all we've got for today, isn't it? Um, that's it for yeah. now. I promise we'll come back and do um, the music we'll, book. We'll do the music book because I don't want to, I don't want to glorify his horrible beliefs. I, I want to come back and just make fun of the more funny stuff. And I think that's a book that'll allow us to do that. Right. Um, and next week, we have Shoshana Fagan coming on, Dr. Shoshana Fagan. If you remember her, uh, sh we had her come on and review the mental health book written by Jack Scopp called Healing for the Inner Hurt. We had her come on like a year ago about and talk about that one. We have uh, a, a, the book that we're reviewing with her is much more famous within fundamentalism and it's famous like beyond fundamentalism as well it's very I, I guess infamous it's notorious um the book we're talking about is to train up a child by michael and debbie pearl uh and we're going to have an extended discussion of that book next week with uh, dr shoshana fagan so that's going to be a really interesting episode and i know that you that we've been asked about this book so many times so we're really excited to talk about it Th yeah uh, uh anything else we've got coming up oh make sure that you send us your pride stories if you are one to to send us a pride story the email is leaving at gmail.com and we'll uh, read them during the month of June on our show, and we would just love to get those stories from you guys and uh, and and read them. Yes, and if you send us a story for Pride Month, of course, make sure that you include your name. If your name that you would like us to call you is different from the name on your email address, definitely let us know. Um, we can use your real name, just your first name, pseudonym, whatever makes you happy, and also let us know what your pronouns are so that we can speak about you correctly. Yes, yes, yes. Um, 
If you like our show, if you're a fan of our show, make sure that you join our Facebook group, facebook.com slash groups slash Eden Exodus. Join our subreddit, which is reddit.com slash r slash Eden Exodus. Our Patreon will have a very extended version of today's episode with lots more uh, of our commentary on things that uh, Peter Ruckman is saying. So be sure to check that out. That is uh, patreon.com slash leaving Eden podcast. Oh, um, can I invite people to my birthday party on yeah, sure. the podcast? Okay. If you are listening to this episode during release uh, in like the week that it is released. So in, in like the last week of April, um, my birthday uh, is a, is May 2nd, but I'm having a party on Friday. If you live in Philadelphia, you are invited to my birthday party. You can come to it if you want. It's going to be a, a, a fun karaoke party. DM me on Instagram and I'll send you the address. Um, I'll probably like check out your page to make sure you're not like a, a weirdo or somebody who wants to come and kidnap me or something but uh I don't you, you know if anybody wants to kidnap you but i don't also don't want like steven anderson showing up to protest your birthday dude if steven anderson Although showed you up would to probably protest think my... that was a great birthday present no if steven anderson came and protested my birthday party i would have so much fun with i'd take a selfie with steven anderson that would be a birthday present for me forever if you took a selfie with steven anderson <laughs> yeah actually if you come to my birthday um i'll let you uh you know what i'll let you do i'll let you draw um on the jack hiles picture oh um, man yeah that's what i'll let you do or at least i'll let you take a picture with the jack hiles picture because when i when i met emmy when i was driving across country um that was a fun thing um anyway you can follow the podcast on facebook and instagram at leaving eden podcast on twitter at leaving eden pod on tiktok at leaving eden podcast sadie your social media you can follow me on instagram at sadie carpenter music on twitter at hell yeah sadie and on tiktok at sadie carpenter one and you can follow me on facebook instagram and twitter at g-a-v-r-i-e-l-h-a-c-o-h-e-n thank you guys so much for tuning into this episode you guys have a great day uh bye bye but No regrets, no confusion